Yes. Uh, David is our very special guest, and David's very special guest is Ian Witt. He's also from San Francisco, and he's uh, assisting. So let's say hi to Ian, too. They're both from San Francisco, California. And Ian uh, helps David in, in the studio that they work at. It's called Public Glass. Ian's a glass artist himself as well, and he works out of the same studio. So we got a lot going on this evening. Uh, we've got David here in the amphitheater, and then we've got a couple bands out there in the auditorium. We have a band. Um, now I'm forgetting the name. But there is a band in the auditorium. And then we have the uh, Dirty Bourbon River show. And they're playing in the, uh, audit in the, in the, uh, in the lobby, in the admissions lobby. So lots of stuff going on. You got food. You got drinks. We hope you enjoy yourself tonight. Uh, this demonstration is going to take a couple hours. Uh, Dave, David's doing a very intricate uh, Marini pattern, and uh, I'll pass around a couple little uh, Marinis that he makes. But Marini is a really, really cool technique, and if you have an opportunity uh, to see the Tiffany's Mosaic show, that's in our Changing Exhibits Gallery. Who's had a chance to see that yet? A few of you. Well, I would recommend uh, checking that out at some point. If you can't see it tonight, well come back to the museum and see that exhibit because uh, they use quite a few Marinis. Uh, Tiffany Studios uh, used a similar technique in making mosaics. They would uh, use Marini to make different imagery on the glass that they would then uh, cut into pieces and include in those incredible architectural mosaics. So we thought it'd be great to have David here uh, to demonstrate his techniques uh, during this time because he works in a, a mosaic pattern as well. This type of patterning is based on the craft and the art of mosaic. So using little pieces to create a composition. And, and David uh, makes these pieces into vessels. Uh, this piece that he's making right now is going to be a hollow vessel inside, but it's going to be a sculptural piece that he calls a bloom. So it's a layered piece. The inside has a layer of Marini. Earlier this morning, David made a bucket-sized cup with white glass on the inside and uh, some gold topaz color on the outside. It's a brilliant amber color. And he's going to put this pattern inside that cup. So he'll have two layers. And uh, the outside will have this beautiful opaly sort of uh, mottled color pattern to it, and the inside of this intricate Marini pattern. I'll come and answer your question. I'll go out there so I can hear you. Natalie Stovall and the Drive is the band in the auditorium. That just came to me. Sorry. What's your question? The cup that, we, uh, that he made this morning is at 1,000 degrees. And I'm not going to pass it around the audience right now and show it to you because I don't want to burn anybody. But it's sitting in this oven over there. See that uh, black oven with all the blue glasses on there? There's four little blue glasses up there. It's sitting there idle uh, because we couldn't bring it down. We couldn't let it cool down. We wanted to keep it at around 1,000 degrees till he needs it. Otherwise, uh, it would take too long to come up. Yeah, we can't see it yet. Um, but it'll be coming out here probably within the next 20 or 30 minutes. Yes, uh, David Patchen uh, has his work on display in the glass market. So you can see some beautiful pieces that he shipped here a few weeks ago that they put up on display. But again, his, uh, most of his work utilizes uh, Marini. And you can see Marini going back to Roman era pieces you know, over 2,000, 3,000 years ago. So it's a really, really ancient uh, way of decorating the glass. And the way it's done is by pulling colored glass into long threads, putting it back together in packages of other little threads, pulling it out again multiple times to get these incredible patterns. And I'm going to go grab a couple of these chips, so the cross sections of these canes after they're pulled out and cut uh, before David lays them out into a composition on a kiln shelf. Uh, he slices them into little discs. And uh, I'll get some that I can hand around so you can see.
All right, so, so these are some of the Marinis. They start out as uh, canes, so David will pull out long, th thin threads of colored glass called cane. Usually uh, there is a white center with some type of transparent color, exterior, and then clear glass. And then he takes, uh, cuts them into rods about this size and um, bundles them together, fuses them together, and then stretches them out again. So that's what these are then, cut into cross section. So it's a multiple uh, stage process where you're stretching the glass. And I'll just uh, pass these around. There's, that's the filigrana cane. And these are the little marinis. You're welcome to look at those, pass them down, show everybody. How's it going? Good. So what David's doing right now with Ian, they're, they, they, David has laid out a sheet of these little discs in a rectangle form. And since they're round, he's going to squeeze them together. So he heats it, then he compresses the pattern using those ninja swords, it looks like. Uh, but they're just basically big pieces of steel. And that's a tool he actually built himself using some uh, Damascus steel that a friend of his made. So he squeezes them together with those paddles, and he's compressed out the little corners that were left empty because these are discs, you know, where there would be empty space. So now he has a rectangular sheet of patterned glass made out of marini sitting on that kiln shelf over by the furnace where those guys are chit-chatting. Now David's got a blowpipe here. He's gathered glass on the end, and he's going to make essentially a ring of clear glass around the head of the blowpipe that he's going to use to pick up that sheet and bring it around into a cylinder to make a nice closed uh, pattern with his marini that he's made. So there's already several hours of work into this piece, maybe a day or so of work already uh, completed to make the pattern. So the glass that David has gathered out of the furnace is 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. It looks like it's orange glass, but it's clear. It's clear glass, just as clear as the windows you see here. It's only orange because of the heat energy that's being emanated, that's being released from the glass. The longer it's out of the furnace, the more it's going to cool. It's going to lose that orange color. Eventually, you're going to see that's clear glass but not too much while he's working the glass because he's always going to be reheating and keeping this piece over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically, he's going to shape this into a, a hockey puck shape or a donut. And we call it a donut because it has a hole in it. That iron pipe that he's got there, the steel pipe that he's turning, has a hole in it. It's like a long steel tube. It's called a blowpipe. That's why we call it glass blowing. We actually inflate the glass if you've not seen glass blowing. If you have seen glass blowing, uh, you will know that this is sort of an advanced process uh, using marinis like this, creating a bubble out of these little chips of glass. So sometimes when you're working the glass, uh, the pipe does get hot. That's a question we get very often is like, uh, you know, do the tools get hot? Does that pipe get hot? Does the heat crawl up that pipe? Well, yeah, it does. And the longer you work with it, the more that's going to start to creep up there. So you use this uh, tool here. It's called a pipe cooler. It's just a tub of water. There's a bilge pump in there that fills a trough. And you put the pipe in the trough, it cools it right down. It's sort of just a fancy bucket of water, really. Okay, so Ian is going to get those little chips of glass that are fused together just to the right temperature. And in just a, a moment here, David's going to pick that up. He's going to do the roll-up. And that's sort of a hold-your-breath moment. Because, again, remember, there's many, many hours of work already into the color pattern. So if something goes wrong here, uh, David's out a lot of work. So there's uh, some steel uh, square stock that's on that flat plate they have, and they use that to deflect the heat because they don't want the edges of the pattern to melt out too much and distort. 
So they use those pieces of steel, they're coated in kiln wash, but they block heat with it to keep the edges from getting runny. And David is very, very particular about his patterns. And you'll see that if you go out and check out his pieces in the, in the uh, glass market, you'll see how meticulously detailed these marini are. Some of the most beautiful marini you can find made today. So that sheet uh, right there, maybe that's around 1,500 degrees. David's going to wait till it's down around 1,000 degrees. He waits till it's leather hard, so it's not too floppy. And here's what we call the roll up, just like that. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause for that move. It seems like it went pretty smooth. So once that happens, uh, David could could uh, breathe a little sigh of relief. Now he's in control of all that work again. And uh, he's going to pull those seams together. So you see there's edges. He's going to take some tweezers. He's going to pull those edges together and form a nice cylinder out of that pattern. Oh, we have a question. Yes. Plus or minus temperature for Marini. So I would say uh, after he comes out of the furnace, they're probably around 1,200 Fahrenheit. Yeah. So we are live streaming this demonstration. So hello to everybody out there watching the live stream. And please uh, send us your questions if you have some. If you have any questions here in the audience, let me know. Hopefully, I can answer it for you. So David's story is very interesting. Uh, he actually started his career in marketing and business. And then he uh, slowly transitioned over to making glass full time. And uh, I think he said he, he's only been doing the glass full time for a handful of years. But he sort of worked his way over, transitioning from somebody working in the corporate world to working as an artist and using the skills uh, that he developed in the corporate world to uh, help enhance his career as a glassmaker. So he knows how to market his own work. He knows how to sell it. He knows about the market. And uh, he also is a hell of a glass blower. All right, so he's pulled those two edges together. And they're stuck. And now he's going to work those together using the marver. So the marver is that big steel counter right there. Chris is cleaning it off. He's making sure there's no little chips of glass on there that David could pick up uh, when he's rolling it back and forth on that table. But he's going to be rolling it on there to compress it further, pushing each one of those little chips together, kind of smushing it into order. And he really doesn't have that long to work with the glass. Once he comes out of that furnace, he's got maybe 20, 30 seconds before he has to go back. It has to be in a specific temperature range for him to work it because he doesn't want to get it too hot. Otherwise, that pattern is going to smear like peanut butter and jelly. Uh, so he has to have it sort of in a range between 1,000 and maybe 1,500 degrees. It's a very narrow range of temperature. And he doesn't want to get it too hot. He doesn't want it to be too cold because he doesn't want it to break apart. Also, he's keeping in mind that the very edges get the hottest. They seem to suck up the heat. And then that heat causes the glass to coagulate and crawl back on itself. So he heats the middle and leaves the ends to get a little colder when he's outside of the furnace before he goes in for a submersive heat here called a flash. So the use of Marini is really an ancient technique in glass making. 
And it was actually used in pottery even before glass making, using cross-section pieces of different types of cane or uh, dis different types of clay to create different patterns. And glass uh, sort of was an extension of that type of industry, the metals and ceramics industries. So ancient Romans would have been using little chips of glass to make small bowls. And you can see pieces like this in our 35 centuries of glass galleries in the ancient glass section. So next time you're in our galleries, keep an eye out for pieces that are patterned with cross-sectioned uh, chips like this called Marini. How long does it take to make the Marini? Uh, that's a good question. Well, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that David probably, uh, he does his work in different batches. So like he'll make Marini for a day or two, and then he'll make a couple vases the next day or something like that. But I, th I think that's how he does it. He does it in batches of things where he's doing one thing at a time. But I imagine maybe in a day he could pull Ten Marini? That's a guess. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. David, how long does it take you to make a Marini typically? It depends, really. He puts yeah. like a, a few layers of color, and then if we do the cane roll-ups, that's a good, good hour and a half. Okay. One Marini bowl. Yeah. yeah. So, so Ian is telling me that um, it, can be, it can vary depending on the complexity of the Marini. So... Uh, if they're rolling a bunch of canes on it, it could take up to an hour and a half or two hours. Um, a simple one could take as little as 30 minutes. There's so. one that he put a bunch of cane in a bundle, though. Okay. And then he pulled that. So that takes, that takes probably about the same, but he had to squeeze all the air bubbles out of it. Gotcha. Stuff, yeah. yeah, so some of the complexity in making these is squeezing the air out of it. Uh, and that takes a lot of time. So it's a very painstaking process. It takes a long time to do. Um, so there's a lot of time invested into to the piece already. Even though he's been working for 30 minutes, uh, there's still already a day of work in that piece. Because not only does it take an hour and a half or two hours to make the, necessity, the, nece the necessary cane and marini stock, but then that has to be sliced up. That, maybe pulls an eight foot long length or a 10 foot long length, that heat needs to be sliced on a diamond saw all the way down to a couple millimeters thick, you know, and you have hundreds of marinis that you can lay out in a rectangle. So that takes another, I don't know how long that would take, but it's a very, very tedious process. There's a lot of work into it. And for glass blowing, it's probably one of the most time consuming processes for decorating the glass in the hot shop. How long did D David patch and practice before coming profi becoming proficient? Well, um, I can tell you it takes most people about five years. And everybody has a different definition of proficiency. But I can tell you, typically and traditionally, it's about five or six years to go into sort of a journeyman phase of glass making. And that's doing it every day. If you do it once a week for five years, uh, you'll be about where you would be after one year of blowing glass uh, every day. So it's cumulative. Uh, it's like flying a plane. The more hours you spend at the furnace, uh, the more experience you have, the better you usually are going to be. So uh, a couple minutes ago, Dave had a uh, cylinder. Now you see he has a nice pear shape there. Uh, with a small hole. Ian's going to take a gather of clear glass out of the furnace and they're going to put it over that hole, seal that up. David's going to use the heat from that fresh glass to start cinching down that hole and sealing it up. And then he's going to have a closed bubble that's made out of all these little chips. So that process, step number 654 out of 6,895 steps, will be complete. Over 6,000. I've been counting all day. 
These ovens are natural gas fired. All right, so there we have it. A little bit of the goo. You really see how goo gooey and stringy that glass is when he does something like that. You just stick it on there and string it off. So actually, uh, David could choose to leave that as a clear glass window in the pattern, but he just uses that for heat. And then he's squirting some water on there to cool it down. He just can't decide what he wants to do. Does he want it hot? Does he want it cold? I don't know. He's doing it for a very specific reason. He wants the outside to be cold, but he wants that heat to sink in so he can grab and cinch that end down. So there's a reason he's doing each part. He squirted a little water on the end there, and it, you could see it started to crack the surface of the glass, but the inside was still like a gel. It's so hot. Hi. Hey, welcome to the amphitheater. Why don't you, there's plenty of seating if you guys want to sit down. Take a load off, relax. Grab a drink. Has anybody seen the bands this evening? Oh, just one person. Wow, they must be really good. Well, how were they? They sound good? I hope so. I bet they do. Yes. What is the diameter of the smallest of the hole in the doors? Uh, I think like six inches. Yeah. Maybe, actually, the, on that one, it's probably about eight inches. They vary. There's no specific. I wore your glass blowing shoes. I did. I'm like, <laughs> the man in front of you is like, the largest hole in there. Oh, oh, the largest hole uh, is like 36, 34 inches. That's when everything's open. Um, so that. The reheat furnace that David's working at is the largest one uh, east of the Mississippi, pretty much. <laughs> there, is one, there is one in Pontiac, Mission, Michigan, that's about the same size, made by the same furnace manufacturer. So uh, Chris Rochelle now, has, he's pulled a cup that David made this morning out of an oven called the garage. And this is going to be an outside veneer. This is uh, going to be the outside surface of this piece. So all that intricate patterning, uh, sorry, so all that intricate patterning that David has on the end of his blowpipe is going to be hidden inside of this opaque bubble. However, he's going to open it up to expose that inside. So that's kind of a unique feature of this style piece that David makes is that you have this hidden treasure inside this flared open form. It's a very sculptural vessel. He calls it a bloom, so it's a very floral piece. So the CMOG team helping out. Catherine Ayers is over at the bench. She's blowing and helping David out. Uh, Chris Rochelle is here with the cup on the end of the iron at this uh, reheater. And our new intern, Lucas Melanick, is here with the paddle in his hand. So let's give them a round of applause too, because they worked hard all day already, and uh, we're all excited to help David make this piece tonight. David, do you guys, uh, do you dip a layer of clear on that before you go in there? Okay. So 
So they're shaping that into a nice concentric form. They're going to let that cool down. And then David's going to go in the furnace and gather some additional glass uh, over the surface of that. It's going to get nice and hot. And then he's going to pu put that down inside of that bubble. Uh, and by doing so, he'll make a nice outer shell of that, out, that uh, topaz color over white. And this is called a cup stuff overlay. So we're getting a lot of questions from online. Does anybody uh, have any questions here in the amphitheater about David or his work or a glass or what we had for lunch? Any questions? Yes, sir. How many pounds of glass? Um, I would say that that Marini pickup is probably four pounds or five pounds, if that. Maybe not even that much. It's quite lightweight. Uh, it's going to gain some weight when he puts that clear over top, probably another couple pounds. By the time they get this cup on there, I would say the piece is probably going to weigh about seven or eight pounds, uh, which at the end of a four-foot steel rod feels about like 40 pounds because it's off the end. Imagine putting a bowling ball on the end of a broomstick and picking it up. It doesn't feel 16 pounds. It feels 60 pounds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, th th this will be a big piece. Uh, it'll probably weigh about 10 pounds, I'm guessing, if that, maybe a little more, actually. Great question. Yes, sir. What's that? Uh, the temperature of this furnace right now, I would say, uh, is probably about 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we, we don't hear, but that's how our glass starts out. We get our glass from a company called Spectrum, and they make cullet, so they mix all the batch, sand or pure silica, soda ash, and limestone, and then they melt it, and uh, it's processed. I see that you got your hand up. I'll be right with you. Um, it's processed, melted, chopped into little pieces, and then we get those little chunks and throw them in our furnace. It's a lot cleaner than using uh, the silica flour. What's that? Um, similar to that, but they're not processed like that. They don't have all the p color patterns. They're just little chunks, and we shove them into our furnace. It melts right down. What's your question? How hot the, can the glass get? It depends on the type of glass. The glass we use here, soda lime silicate, uh, probably don't want to get much more than 2,500 degrees. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get it out of the furnace. It'd be too runny. The hotter it is, the runnier it is. Uh, right now, it's sort of like molasses. It's thick. You can gather up a nice ball of it. If it's too hot, you can't get any of it. It'll just slip right off the iron. Do you have a question? I think you've asked me a question before. Are you sure? Okay. I think I remember you asking me a question just like this one. All right, we're going to let you get it together on your question. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay. All right. Oh, wow. Look at that nice close up of that pattern. Wow, that is really cool. So, um, one of the cool things about the patterns you see is uh, David uses different types of color that have. Uh, different viscosity when they're worked. So the white glass is very stiff and then the colored glass around the white glass is very soft. So if you look at those little chips that I passed around, where are those at? Who's got those right now? Okay. One, two. 
Uh, if you look at them close, you see the little white dots in the center of the colored glasses. It looks like little white pimples or something. That's a stiff glass, and when you blow that out, when you heat it up, that remains rigid, and then the soft glass kind of sinks in, so you get this beautiful texture on the surface. But some colors will, when they get hot, when they melt, they sort of squish out and they diffuse. Uh, and other colors, like this white, it's called Opaloduro. It's very, very stiff. It has to get very, very hot to get soft. It won't move at all, so it makes nice crisp lines to back up the transparent colors. And there we go. David has taken another gather. He's got that second layer of glass on there, which is clear glass out of our furnace. The first layer, of course, is the cylinder he rolled and shaped into the uh, bubble made out of the Marini. And now this layer, or maybe even the next one, is going to go in. Is there going to be another dip on this, Ian? Nope. Okay. So he's going to stuff this into the cup that Chris has. Yes? What goes into Duro to make it so stiff? Well, uh, some nasty stuff. Uh, arsenic is one of the ingredients in Apollo Duro. Um, cryolite, I'm not exactly sure, but there's se some heavy opacifiers in it that almost make it like a ceramic material. Um, we do have a scientist on staff. I'll have to ask him. He probably knows better than me. So David is getting this into a, a nice uh, bullet-shaped form. It has to have this parabolic curve so that when he goes down into this cup here, it doesn't create any gaps. The key here is not to trap any air, and that's the hardest part of this technique for overlaying, is that it's very easy to trap uh, bubbles of air in there. If the glass goes down in there and, you get, and it sucks in in one side, it folds on itself, you're going to get a bear, big air pocket between the layers. So this is, um, he's going to make it look easy, but it takes a long time to be able to understand how that glass is going to flow out properly so it doesn't trap air bubbles. What's that? OK. Um, so that mold that's there on the floor is uh, just going to act as a cup holder, essentially, uh, for the cup that Ian has that's about as big as a bucket. So they're going to break that off the iron. Chris has some gloves on. He's going to set it into the mold. Uh, and that mold will just hold it in place. Yeah. And they're not going to stick them together like that. They're going to do it in a uh, vertical fashion. So they'll break the cup off of the iron. Chris is going to catch it. He's going to set it into that um, mold, that aluminum mold that's on the floor there that Catherine was shooting the torch at. And then David will drop that bubble down into that bucket. And we're all going to keep our fingers crossed so that he doesn't trap any air. But we know he won't because he's done this a couple times. <laughs> wow, that's great. Wow. David, you're breaking you're breaking the internet. There's a over a thousand people watching your live stream right now. <laughs> All right, so here goes the cup stuff. Perfect time to say something like that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, here we go. Drum roll. And there we have the beautiful cup stuff. Cup stuff. All right. Step 600 and 840. I don't know. There's a lot of steps to this process. What kind of clear glass are we using? This is a question from the internet. Uh, we are using a soda lime silicate made by Spectrum Glass Company. It's the Spectrum Studio Nuggets 2.0. Spectrum makes stained glass as well, correct, yes. Or they did, they don't anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Who is? How do I block him, Mandy? Um, I think if you click on the little button. Thanks, but no thanks. Steven Kramer. <laughs> All right. How's it going, John? Is that Chalcedonia glass on the outside? Uh, no. Uh, it looks a little swirly because uh, David did a uh, what he calls a wild wrap, wild wrap, on the outside of the stuff cup bubble. Um, he used a gold topaz over white, and then what was left over after they did the overlay, Ian coated in clear, and then they wrapped that all over the outside. So it kind of puts a, it offsets the color a little bit in those sort of swirly and natural ways. Do you guys know if this is uh, the last? Does this get dipped on or no? It does, OK. All right, so David's going to work this into a nice shape. He's going to seal up the hole in the bottom. And he left that hole uh, because he wanted to be able to force the air out through the bottom. Remember how I said he didn't want to trap any air? There's always going to be a little air trapped in there. So by having a hole in the bottom, it's a great way to be able to force the air out the bottom, too. The air goes up the sides. The air goes out the bottom. You don't necessarily need that hole, but it's also uh, easier to create the cup if you don't have to put it on a, a punty. So he sealed up the hole. Uh, now the color pattern goes all the way around the bubble. He's going to start to compress this even more, and then he'll gather some more clear glass out of our furnace over the top of that for the finer, final layer, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yes, 
uh, I believe uh, David used Spectrum to make the Marini as well. Uh, he works at a, a public access studio. He's got his own studio within that one, but then he blows glass in the public area. Uh, and they use the same type of glass. Uh -huh. uh, and David brought his Marini with him. They're so time consuming, that, and he's only here for a couple days, uh, that he really didn't have time to do all the prep work. So he did a lot of the prep work at home and figured out what he wanted to make here and brought all the stuff he needed, almost all the stuff. Right, how much weight is on the pipe? Uh, right now, I'm guessing probably a little over 10 pounds. Maybe not quite. So David is cutting that off using diamond shears. It's a way to cut the glass down to a small diameter. Like this, yeah. Is that better? Yep, okay. So that pad that David is using to shake the glass over and over, that is wet newspaper. If you haven't seen glass blowing before, you might think that's a, a little bit of a surprise. But we use that every day, and we keep that soaking in water so the newspaper doesn't burn away with the intensity of the glass. Is that better? So that, most of that is steam coming off of there. Some of it's smoke. But that is uh, the steam basically burning off the, the paper. So now they're going to wait just a little while. They're going to let that bubble cool down a little bit uh, because they're going to go back into the furnace and gather another layer of glass over the top. They don't want it to superheat that core so much that it gets soft enough to drip back into the furnace. That would be a disaster. All these hours of work, uh, you wouldn't want it to drip back in. So he's going to let it get to cool to the point uh, where the glass will be stiff and rigid enough to hold the heat and the weight of the next layer of glass. All right, getting ready for the final gather here. What do you guys think so far? You enjoying yourselves? All right, keep that enthusiasm going. Dave Patchen, he's been here since yesterday morning making absolutely incredible work. Uh, we're, we're really, really pleased and very fortunate to have him and Ian here working uh, with our team. So uh, this will be the final gather. Now there's quite a bit of prep work that's already gone into this one piece, the Marini alone to make, the color cup that he made early this morning, um, stuffing everything together and one final gather and to create this beautiful piece of glass. So you can see it's really important to give it a little bit of time in between these gathers of glass because as soon as you plunge this into that furnace, that crucible of glass, it starts to heat everything up right away. And if your temperatures are a little too warm when you dip in there, then that core starts to slump off center. It can collapse. Bad things can happen. So beautiful strip gather right here. See that, yeah, it's here for that.
Love that. And of course, our pipe cooler. Absolutely wonderful to be able to cool these down, give ourselves more leverage. You've got a good fan club here. Dave, is this going to be one of those cornucopia pieces? Cornucopia? Awesome. Very, very cool. Yep. Sweet. Looking forward to that. He hasn't made one of these here yet uh, with us anyway. He made a bottle yesterday, a couple of bottles yesterday, and one of those beautiful flattened forms that have the pulled points on the top with um, amazing Marini in there. So we'll move right through the process here. Did a quick little change. Jeff did a great job narrating, um, but I'll take over and finish us off here on the final side of things. And Jeff will jump in and give a hand. And you're going to see that a lot of people really come together to make this big work happen smoothly. And here it looks like he's got a little bubble that might have been in the glass. He's picking it out, plucking it out, and just trimming it out of there. Um, that's a pretty common move if you don't want any air bubbles in there. And what I just did was push the glass on the surface of the pot back. Sometimes you get a lot of bubbles on the surface, and that will just help to eliminate some of them. But with a big gather like that, it's... It's almost inevitable to pick up one or two tiny ones, so you can just pluck it out of there easily. Any questions about what we've been working through so far? All right. Well, a little more history with David. He comes from San Francisco. He's actually originally from New York, but he's been working at Public Glass in San Fran for quite some time. That's where Ian uh, works with him as well. They've been working together for about four or five years. So he brought him out. And it's very obvious when you see a team working like this together, it's very fluid. It's very cohesive. There's not really much communication. That's ap there's always communication, but there's not a lot of talk about it. Sometimes it's just a little nod of the head or a quick little motion with your hand. And the two are very in tune with each other. And they've worked together for a very long time. The setup here for our uh, bigger stuff, you can see this is our jumbo reheating furnace that we've been running the last couple days. It's much more comfortable to work larger scale out of. And we have these invested rails, which are really, really nice. A lot of people ask us about the yoke, is what we call this, the rollers that moves back and forth. They say, why do you keep pushing that in and out? And that just helps give us more leverage when we set the pipe on that and we can push it forward and moves the fulcrum point, right? So it just gives us a lot more control. Because if you notice, you probably noticed already, but the constant attention and that torque that we're always applying to the blowpipe, especially now with this is probably 25 pounds of glass maybe. The pipe that he has is about 25 pounds as well. But you, one, can't hold it all the way up because it's very, very hot on that side. But two, when everything gets hot and it's moving around, if you imagine as it slumps off center, the torque you have to apply to get it back on center is very, very great. And that can be costly on your arms, your hands, your wrists and everything. So we're really trained as glassmakers to keep things running on center throughout the process, and it, it's easier that way. But if it tips off center, it makes it really difficult to manage. And it's very common when you have a, a big piece like this to have a whole team, one person that's shielding right now. David's wearing this big puffy Kevlar sleeve, which is a great insulated material, but it only goes uh, so far when you have you know, close to 2,000 degrees, a giant gob of glass right next to your arm. So that wooden board just shielding right there is, is very nice. Uh, so Catherine is helping out with that. Ian's taking over the pipe, taking these reheats. Gravity is a very good tool for glass making, right? It's very, very important that you learn how to work with it. Now, for beginners, when they first try to gather glass out of the oven, gravity's terrible. It's awful. It wins. Glass drips on the floor, gets out of control very quickly. Uh, but once you learn how to work with it, it's fantastic. And he said right after he gathered this, the, the cornucopia piece, he's going to dump it out is what he calls it. So he'll let the, the glass really start to stretch quite a ways and create the tail section of that sculptural form and do some curving to it before we work on the opening. But traditional glass blowing is where we begin on a blow pipe. And all the pieces down here that were made at the, the demonstrations start off on a pipe. We inflate to the volume that we're looking for, and then we'll flip the piece around 180 degrees to work on the opening, and we'll see that at some point here. But this is a Marver, just a steel table, very basic tool, but a very, very functional one, a great tool in the glass studio. We can use this to shape the material, but we can also use it as a heat absorber, a heat sink. Now, a lot of times we want to draw a temperature out of certain areas, and that section that he's rolling on the table is going to turn into the, the tip of the form, and if you want some extra thickness there, then he can sort of cool that section before reheating and inflating further. So we're managing the heat distribution by doing so. The metal's a great heat sink. 
Same purpose with the tools, that folded up newspaper that he's been working with. When he starts to shape that as we're inflating it, looks like we're getting close to that, he'll probably hold the paper where he doesn't want the bubble to blow up, and that will retain thickness there as well. If you think of it this way, every time we reheat the first thing into that oven and the last thing out is the furthest part of the glass. So that's always getting more heat. And if you want to balance that, you can cool that section a little bit. Sometimes we'll even torch the other section to spike up the temperature a little bit more. We get these great camera shots down here. Literally not a bad seat in the house. These are new, right? Everybody that sits up here, most of the glass blowers sit up in this realm. They really like to get the bird's eye view, the hot shop. And uh, we put these monitors up not too long ago, so it's fantastic. Everybody here can really see a nice close-up shot of what's happening. This is what I was talking about, now using a torch to heat up that other section while the tip of the bubble stays out of the heat and loses a little bit of temperature. It's what we call a fluffy torch, and it's just propane. And it's probably about 1,500 Fahrenheit. That's not really a hot torch. I know it does sound hot, and it is for all intents and purposes. But the true hot torch, it's up here. You might see him use, runs on oxygen and gas. And that one will get close to 4,000, maybe 3,500 Fahrenheit. And that will really liquefy the surface of the glass. You see how Ian turns both directions? Very important. If he only turns one direction the entire time, that pattern starts to spiral and corkscrew around on itself. Some cases you use that. If you want to intentionally create a spiral like these pieces down here, you would turn only one direction. But if you don't want that to happen, then it's very important you turn evenly both directions. All right, this is a very significant move. This is really, really important. He squeezes down into the glass with a big pair of jacks. That's the most versatile glass making tool that we have. There's many different types of jacks, um, but they're all basically the same in profile. The blade, the, uh, the handle, and the strap, the head of the tool. And you squeeze into the glass with these, basically butter knives, if you will, and form a nice tight constriction. When we go to remove this piece, that constriction is the weak spot. That's where we're going to snap it free. And the tighter that line is, the more he really reiterates that and focuses on making a nice clean line, the better off it'll break free, the easier it'll break, and the less likelihood we'll take a chunk out of the side of the bubble when we do. So it's a very important move. And if you saw a little flame popping off from that, it's beeswax that we put on the jacks as a lubrication that was just burning away. Compressed air. I can hear him using some air. That cools the glass quickly, blasting air onto it. And it can be quite challenging at this point because there's a lot of opaque color on there. That cup that he stuffed the Marini bubble into has a complete layer of opaque white on there. So we won't actually see through it at any point. He's got to rely on his experience and expertise to know how much glass he gathered and how far he can inflate it before that gets too thin to really manage the way he needs it to. Now, this is a very specific heat. Ian's not all the way in the doors at the moment. You can see he's most of the way in, but he's left the back section out of the oven doors. And this is giving a nice spot heat to one half of that bubble, probably two thirds of it. And this is a good indicator to the me he's probably going to begin stretching this form now. And he wants to leave that top section bulbous. If he heated the whole thing and they stretched it, it would turn into a long skinny tube. But he wants to leave a bulbous section up there and have it taper down. So that has a lot to do with the types of heat that you take before you start really committing to elongating it. People ask us quite frequently, how do you know how long to heat, what the temperature of the glass is at, do you look at it, engage the heat, what's, what's going on there? Most of it's really experience. You really learn the timing. You get sort of an intuition with it. Um, but with a big piece like this especially, you can feel it getting hotter as you're turning because gravity's pull is much greater on it, and you have to increase the torque to really compensate. So we can really feel that in our hands. But this is exercising great control over stretching this form. You could see if he just stopped turning for a split second, it would just bend right in on itself. And it collapsed, it would touch together, and it would be game over, basically. This is where the posture at the bench gets a little bit more tiresome, a little more taxing on your body. You can see David is leaning way out here because he's got to keep turning, but he's got to lean out and lift up with his right hand, and you're kind of torqued in this awkward position. Sometimes glass blowers will hook their leg in to the arm of the or the the foot arm of the bench and give them sort of an anchor to lean out with. 
Now, a lot of times we don't wear gloves because the stainless steel pipes, we can hold on to most of them throughout the process. Uh, but when we get close to the glass like this, we can put a glove on. We do any kind of sculpting or manipulating. We get really close like this. And that's what he's done is put this glove on his right hand. So now we start to get into the sculptural side of things. And it becomes very important that as he stops, that he flips perfectly 180 degrees each time. And that keeps things on center. If you don't have a nice smooth 180 flip, then it starts to get offset. And then everything gets a little wonky. And then it's really hard to manage after that. That's great, isn't it? Cutting through the glass is pretty easy if the temperature's right. It's very, very soft when it's hot like that. And there's a specialty shear that he was just using. Now, I'll show you two different types. We've got straight shears. I think everybody can identify with those, right? We all probably have something like this at home. Cuts paper, cardboard, whatnot. Anybody have a pair of these except the glass blowers? These are diamond shears. And this refers to the blade aperture, aperture that comes together. There's no diamonds in the metal. It's just regular steel. Uh, but they squeeze and crimp the glass. So they do two different things. You can grab and pull the glass, or you can squeeze all the way and cut it. So the straight shears will cut to a straight uh, point, if you will. But the diamond shears cut more of a blunt shape. So there's purposes for both of them. But the diamond shears are a, a specialty shear for glass making. This gets much harder to contend with now, too, with the reheats, because as he goes in the oven, it's gotten much skinnier. It wants to bend a little bit sooner. So he's going to pay really close attention to it as he's in there and be careful to turn both directions nice and evenly. Gets longer, too, right? So his leverage drops a little bit. He's really got to throw his back and his body into it to handle the pipe a little bit more. So it looks like they're starting to make the bend here. Maybe not, or maybe just continuing to stretch to the desired taper. So the cup that he stuffed all that Marini into does have that big layer of white, a very dense layer of white. But he put a lot of gold, this transparent gold topaz color around it. And he sort of streamed it on there as he was making the cup. That was this morning. And that's how you can see this sort of streaky effect to it. It's really nice. Very pretty. There's the hot torch. Now we can adjust that. We can turn it. Yeah, you can clap for anything. If you like something that you see, let them hear it. We love the enthusiasm. And we can turn that torch up or down. There's two different dials on there, one for oxygen and one for natural gas. So you can really crank up the heat on it. Nice little curve. So to work on the other side, to work on the opening, once he has the tail bent the way he wants and everything situated nicely, we're going to attach a handle called the punty to the tail section. And then we can hold on to it while we break it free from the blowpipe. It's a very, very tricky transfer, especially for something large and sculptural like this. And before we do that, we want to balance the temperature. We want to balance out the heat. We're going to allow the tail, that curved section, to lose enough heat and turn completely rigid, motionless. But we need to keep the other section warm enough so it doesn't crack. Soda lime glass, what we're working with, is very, very uh, prone to thermal shock if it cools too quickly below a certain temperature. And for this particular soda lime, that temperature is about 900 degrees. That's where we can't fall below too rapidly. Otherwise, the glass wants to crack. The annealing process, the slow cooling cycle, takes the things we make from 900 down to room temperature gradually. And for a piece like this, I'm guessing we'll put it on a 24-hour annealing program. So he's putting a blob of glass right on the end of the tail. And I'm guessing this is going to be our punty patch. So this will be material that turns into scrap in the end. Right now, it will serve a very good purpose to hold on to the, the punty that we're going to attach. And I'm, I'm assuming he'll cold work this off. That's a taglia that he's using, just a big metal paddle. It's like a spatula. You can see, actually, all the rods and the blowpipes, when we pull them out, we pull them from this rack. This is our pipe warmer. 
you do have to heat up the metal on the end to have the glass and the furnace actually adhere properly. If you use like a cold blowpipe, you could dip it into the oven and collect glass, but it wouldn't seal to the pipe and it causes a lot of problems. It can start to crack off as you're working with it. Um, you just need to have them preheated to about 1100, 1200 degrees. That's what that's running at. So I think Ian is going to start up our punty. And it'll probably take a couple gathers. This is a pretty heavy object. So when we gather up glass for the punty, we shape it up. We get the punty to the right temperature before attaching it. Um, but we want to make it stable when we attach it. So when we break the piece free from the blowpipe, it's not wobbling around out of control. Um, so usually for something like this, we do a sculpture punny or a cold core punny where we'll gather a layer of glass, we'll shape it up a little bit, and let it get nice and really rigid, drop in temperature quite a bit. And then we'll gather another layer of glass on that, shape it up, and attach it. So the fresh layer adheres nicely to the patch, but that cold core, that rigid core, provides a lot of stability. And he's got a counterweight punny. This is one of our largest ones that we have out here. And I'll just show you a difference. Punnies come in all different sizes, different gauges for the metal. This is a pretty small one, a small counterweight, and there's no way you would want to attach this to that because you'd have no torque to control it when you got it. So he's got one that's about three times the diameter. And the counterweights are great, especially for taller pieces and heavier pieces because it might seem a little strange to say, well, why do you want to put more weight on something when you're already lifting something heavy? But when they're counterbalanced, it helps it to maintain a nice level profile as you're heating. Again, so the name of the game right now is just to balance the temperatures and keep the temperature right using the torch to heat up certain areas that are a little cooler, and that's a relative term, right, that aren't as warm, allow other areas to lose temperature. And he also has to pay attention to how thin that tail has gotten because those thinner appendaged areas lose temperature quicker. So now he's using the torch to keep that warm because the thicker parts stay warmer longer. So you really have to pay constant attention to the glass as you're working with it. Because you could have that whole object sort of moving around, but if the tip of that tail got a little too cold, it could actually crack. It could, it could fall apart. You just one more dip on that, Ian? Yeah, so Ian's actually he's dunking that first gather into a bucket of cool water to really chill the surface. And then when he's ready, not that cold anymore. No, it's pretty warm now. To lukewarm water. This furnace has a very large ceramic pot and it'll hold a thousand pounds of glass. We've gone through quite a bit the past few days. I would guess there's maybe maybe four or five hundred pounds in there right now. All right. So this is where it's very, very important that everybody's watching the movements of the piece and the punty. It's got to come together at just the right moment. As soon as you attach the punty, you're committed to transferring the piece. And if your piece is a little too cold, then it can crack very, very easily. So you want to make sure that it's really in sync. Cooling the punty, that's a nice move here because he can really grab up with more leverage as soon as he gets that piece on the end. And he'll give this some marvering. And this is where that constriction line, remember the jacks he squeezed into the bubble earlier? This is where that line becomes very important. You want this piece to break right when you tell it to. And that line uh, is what ensures that. So he's got a nice shape. Now he's got the tip of that glass pretty hot, and that's going to fuse pretty good to that patch. He's going to give it another blast of heat here just to make sure it's warm enough. You can see the piece has a little movement to it. You might think that's bad, but that's actually a very good thing. That's sort of a safety net because as soon as we get the punny attached, we're going to need probably... 30 seconds, maybe a minute, to really let that punny connection stabilize so we've got enough heat in the piece that we're, we're good. That's what we're looking for. So the punny's attached. 
And here he's actually pulling back ever so slightly. And if you look very closely, can you see how it sort of created this concave little section in between the, the punty and the patch? So part of that punty he attached will fuse for good. It'll stay there on that patch. But then he just made another little constriction by pulling it back. So that'll be our final breakoff line. Compressed air to really help stabilize that. Ian can sort of feel if he lifts up or down, that punny moves very easily. That means it's really unstable when he catches it. A little more air, keeping the tail nice and warm with the torch. And there's a few different ways we could pop this off here. David's going to put a little bit of water onto it. A little water with the tweezers right on the constriction. This creates tiny little cracks. You can see that's a great shot right there in the camera. All these little cracks form right away. That area is very weak, and then a little vibration is all it takes to do the rest. Big round of applause. Nice move. Great catch. <laughs> Beautiful. That's exciting, right? For beginner glassmakers, that's the most harrowing part. They're, they usually, that's the, the part they fail at the most, I would say. Nicely done. So this produces the opening. Now we need to take some time and really soak the heat back into the glass. We've got to really get the heat back in there. <laughs> I don't think they're going for it, Jeff. No. <laughs> but how about another round of applause anyway? There we go. <laughs> David. <laughs> Fantastic. So this gets really, really tricky. You can already tell, right, as he's heating in the doors and as he's going to push the piece in, he's going to watch for that tail. If he smacks the tail against the door, that's going to break it very, very quickly, very easily. So you've got to be really cautious at this point. I can still see it's moving slightly on the punty right now. And again, that's sort of a safety net. That means that we have enough heat that it'll stay on the punty. That punty is really based on temperature, the strength of it anyway. So if it loses too much temperature, then the, sh the sheer weight and leverage working against it can cause the piece to drop. So we've got to keep it warm the entire time. You'll probably see the team using that fluffy torch occasionally when they're at the bench, torching the punty, keeping the heat there, doing what they need to do. but taking a good moment to soak the heat back in. This is usually the longest reheat of the process because we've dropped down to that 1,000 degree range where the glass is entirely rigid and it takes a while to really build it back up. But it's the same thing, this, this flipping, this, this transfer to the punty, all these pieces went through it. Whether it's a big bowl, a vase with a really long skinny neck, these sculptural forms down here, everything went through this, even the goblet. But the key to working like this, and David's fantastic one to watch for it, is working efficiently. You get all the heat in the glass that you need. You come back to the bench. The clock is ticking. You have a very short time in certain cases to work the material before having to reheat again. But he's great at getting that temperature and just getting right to work and doing what he needs to do um, efficiently, which is great. Using a pair of tweezers now, he's pinching and pulling, pulling the lip. That's elongating it a little bit, but primarily it's thinning the glass. It stretches it thinner, and then he cuts away those tweezer marks, and this leaves behind a nice clean edge on the top. Beautiful, right? Yeah, let's give him a round of applause for that. That's where you really have to be in sync with the person that's turning the pipe, because we get used to trimming something as we turn the pipes ourselves, you know, a smaller form. But when your assistant is turning and you're trimming, you really have to be right in line with each other, really in tune. Otherwise, the shears get bound up, your trim gets offset. But cutting into glass, it's, it's a great sensation. If it's hot enough, right, it's like cutting through an orange peel. It doesn't take a lot of pressure with the shears as long as it's right temperature. So he's got another pair of jacks out here. These are a special pair. They're made from graphite. They have the metal, uh, the steel top to them, the handle, uh, but they're graphite sticks. And then he actually preheated those really quickly. I don't know if anybody caught that. He grabbed those and he stuck them in the furnace door for a brief moment because the graphite is a really good heat sink too. And I mentioned how we use heat sinks intentionally 
But if you don't want the glass to chill fast when you're using a tool, you can preheat that tool. See Catherine jumps in there with that board again, just shielding him from all the heat, especially when that torch blasting in there. It's also blasting the heat back out. And that can get very uncomfortable. Jeff's doing a good job of running the doors, too. He's trying to keep the heat in that furnace. You open up all the doors, the heat drops very quickly. It will recover, but it can take a little bit of time. So especially opening more doors like this, we really open and close them to help keep the temperature in. And you'll notice how carefully Ian handles the punty from this point on. Very important. When you're on the blowpipe, you can sort of set it down much heavier because you're sealed around the pipe. Um, but at this point, that punting connection is very, very small compared to the rest of the piece. So he's so gentle when he sets it down on the rail and the rollers. So specifically heating one little line right there on the interior this tells us he's going to do some, some type of contouring right there maybe. Push that in or flatten it. So Lucas is going to take over doors. I'm guessing we're pretty close to the final shape here. I think Jeff is the one that will load this piece into the annealer. See these big boxes on the sides of our stage? Those are our annealers. And the one that we're going into is this large one on the, the ground level over here. Plenty of space in there. But to load it into that oven, you literally have to put your whole body, almost your whole body in there. So we've got aluminized sleeves. We've got a head shield, um, head gear that we put on, big gloves. So Jeff will really gear up when the time comes. Oh, he's actually cutting into it. Nice cut. And it starts to peel it. So very nice to use that hot torch to get that specific line of heat where he wants to cut. Because if he heated the whole thing to cut it, what do you think would happen to the form? It would start to really slump and distort, right? So he used that torch just specifically heat that one line that he was going to cut into. And it didn't distort the shape much, if at all. The rollers on that yoke, too, it's great. As he turns, the, the, the bearings actually rotate, too. So he can come out, and it gets him a lot closer proximity to the bench. So there's less distance to travel, less awkward to pick the piece and turn all the way around with it. But you open up more and more doors in that oven, you can really feel the heat out of that. There are four burners shooting a lot of energy, natural gas and forced air, into that oven. And once you stand in front of it, it gets uncomfortable fast. We do have the heat shield to protect the person that's there, even a spot glass, that sight glass to look through. So it knocks out the infrared rays. Different types of heat out of the different types of torches. Again, that's just a propane torch, and that's a lower temperature. So it's more of a general warming over of, of areas where the hot torch is really starting to liquefy the glass. So you can see at this point, David's actually using two different sets of shears, and that's perfect for the diamond shears. You can grab, crimp, and pull that form with them. You can see that Jeff is now using that torch to heat the punty, to keep the punty nice and warm, keep everything stable. So David, we had a question, the color, I know the white and then the gold on the outside, but the marini, what color do you have in the marini there in this one? White threads with scarlet. White threads with scarlet. And then next to white threads with yellow. 
at, next to white threads with the yellow. And then a bunch of white threads and gold. White threads and gold. So very, yeah, so a very warm yellows, oranges, amber tones, reds in there. Um, the exterior is that gold topaz, and it's sort of been streaked around there. And there's a layer of white that doesn't really look white anymore. The white is just sort of a buffer um, between the marini that's on the inside and the gold streaky patterns on the outside. If you didn't put the white layer in there, then the marini would sort of mesh visually with the exterior. So the white serves that purpose. It's almost like a gesso on a canvas. And he put a good chunk of it in there, too. He used a pretty big bar of white to make sure it was dense enough. We were talking about that earlier. I was talking with Ian about color use today. And some of the color bars, um, different colors are denser than others. And you learn which ones are dense and how much you need. But some people tend to want to skimp on the color use. And for a piece of this caliber, you wouldn't want to do that. You might save yourself $10 of color if you used half the amount of white. But it would be a shame to put all the effort into it and then peek through part of it and see that you didn't use enough, right? And then the color doesn't look right. But learning the color is a whole other art form in itself. Does this say how many people we have watching online right now? How many people are watching online? Do you guys have that? About 250 from YouTube. Fantastic. Well, this is our uh, summer kickoff 2300. This starts our summer schedule. Tomorrow will be open 12 hours a day. And we also have a really fun event happening this weekend called Glass Fest. And the team has been gearing up getting the studio ready on Centerway Square, which is right across the bridge, downtown Market Street area. And we'll be doing glass blowing demonstrations there all weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. There's the live music that happens, I think, on all those days and evenings. There's fireworks. There's vendors out in the street. Um, a lot of activity. So this is a perfect kickoff for that. And a beautiful piece of glass really coming to life. Again, Jeff being very attentive with that secondary torch, heating not just the punty but the tail, too. You know, And that just really takes a good feel for... Well, I think that that's really thin. We've been away from the heat for a little while. I should give a little bit of heat to it. And I can hear Ian talking with Lucas because Lucas is running the doors and he closes the doors up while Ian's all the way in. Uh, but. It, Really need to pay attention to Ian when he says, okay, open the doors. I need to come out now. The longer you stay in the oven, the more that piece moves around. And if you're in there too long, you can't control it any further. But they're building up a good amount of heat in that top section, that flared out section. Sometimes it doesn't really look like a lot's happening. They're like saying they're taking several reheats and the shape looks the same, but they're getting the heat right. They're really soaking the temperature into the material the way they need to before they do a move with the piece, before they shape it a certain way. And it takes patience to be able to do that and a lot of skill to understand how to do it and the timing involved. Here we go. We like that. Beautiful, right? Yeah. Very slick. That's the importance of getting the heat that you need. Because you wanted that whole section to really bend and move together. Looks like he might get rid of the tips there. So those tips that provided him the, the grabbing points to pull and stretch that form, uh, he's just using a hot torch on them, and it looks like he might just chop them off there, smooth them out.
This is a nice tool that he's picked up. That's a cork panel. Cork is a really nice material to shape the glass with. You can see the other one to the pair of those cork paddles. So it's cork like you'd find in a wine bottle or a champagne bottle, just a larger piece and a wooden handle that's been screwed onto it. For materials, the wood, the newspaper, the metal, the graphite, the cork is the softest on the glass. You can really get in there and sort of rub the glass and move it around. This won't leave residue behind. It doesn't scratch the surface. Even the wooden paddles, you might not think it, the wooden paddles, if you scuffed the surface right now, would leave some residue behind that probably would not burn away or wipe off. And the cork does not. It's great. Looks like we were losing oxygen before. I think Catherine just had switched out a bottle or something. I can tell the pressure just kicked up quite a bit on that torch. Again, lots of very careful movements back and forth. All it takes is just one too heavy handed set down with that punty and the piece hits the floor. And you'll see a lot of torch work even when we get to the final product here. When they have the final shape, they'll use that torch quite a bit to really balance the heat out one more time before finally removing this from the punty. Just as critical as the rest of the process. Now we're almost opening all the doors on that reheating furnace, but we have one more final set I doubt we'll need for this, um, but they're sliders. So the doors we've been using at this point are called barn doors is what we call them because both sides open up independently, but to create a nice ring um, for good heating. But the sliders will pull out and it gives us quite a bit of space in that, but that's when the heat really drops in that oven. So if you're using those, uh, you, you really wanna be Careful not to have them open too long. But it's a very good design because we can make a really, really large piece of glass out of that.
All right, we can see Jeff gearing up here. The aluminized jacket reflects heat very, very well. He'll get the headgear on at some point. Big Kevlar mittens. Catherine's going to give him a hand with that. Pretty cumbersome outfit, but it's really nice to have when you're holding on to a very large 1,000-degree piece of glass. And again, the annealing cycle, the slow cooling process, I'm assuming we'll put this on a 24-hour run. So from 900, 24 hours to gradually come down to room temperature. That time frame is really based on how thick or large a piece of glass is, thickness primarily. If you make something really, really thick, like the Mount Palomar telescope lens, which is in our innovation center, that takes a much longer time to anneal. And that one took about a year to slowly cool because it's over 40,000 pounds of glass. A little more than 20 tons of material, one solid object. But the smaller pieces, all the stuff down here, 12 hours is plenty of time. A little goblet, you could probably anneal in six hours. It'd be okay. About 24 hours, I'm assuming, for this one, just for safety's sake. There's no harm in annealing it longer than it needs to go, but there would certainly be harm in not taking enough time. A lot of stress builds in the glass if it's cooling too quickly, and it cracks if there's too much of it. So David is really getting the, the heat back into the punty as well. It might seem counterintuitive to some people to say, well, why do you want the punty to start moving? You want it to be fragile to break off. But if that punty's moving, then that means that that patch also has enough heat too. So when we go to break this free, the patch will remain on the piece. The last thing you don't want to happen, uh, that you definitely don't want to happen, is the patch to take a chunk out of the tail of that. So getting the heat there, and then we can shock that little constriction with cold water, a metal tool, something of that nature. And any movement that we're seeing now is in the punty. The piece itself is pretty much totally rigid. That punty's got a little movement, which is what he's looking for. Here we go. Jeff's going to cradle underneath of it just in case it pops off before you give a tap on that punty. Now, you might want to applause when it comes off, but I caution you to not do that because Jeff might drop it on the way over here, so we want to give him... Fair chance, don't want to rattle him. I'm sure he's fine, but we'll wait until this gets into the annealer. Jeff, over here. Psych. Okay, into the annealer that's on, it goes. Safe and sound, we'll close it. Now a big round of applause for the team. That's David Patchen.